morning. It's good to be with you at Renor Baptist Church, uh, virtually at least. And I'd like to start by reading a verse about God, about God's character. It's a good place to start, isn't it? By reading about God and what he is like. Psalm 7 and verse 17 says this, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. With that in mind, let's come to the Lord and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Lord Most High. We thank you, Lord, that there is no one else like you. We thank you, Lord, for your awesome power and majesty. And we thank you, Lord, for your righteousness as well. Father, we thank you that when we come to you, you are one who is right and just and good and holy. There's no shadow of turning. There's no division. There's no confusion or chaos like there is in the world around us. But you are righteous and steadfast and pure. Father, we pray that we would have thankful hearts, that despite whatever turmoil we might be going through, we would sing your praises while we have breath. Father, we thank you then that you are that good and that holy and that righteous God. Lord, we reflect that a year has gone by since we first entered lockdown and such a strange year, such a difficult year. And yet, Lord, we want to thank you that your word, the word of God, is not locked down. But your word is still powerful to save lost sinners and to direct us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that your word would thrill us and encourage us and build us up this morning. We thank you, Lord, that your word has power. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be working amongst us to stir us up to convict us, to teach us, if necessary, even to rebuke us. But Lord, we pray that you would truly bless us as we meet together in this way. Father, we want to pray for the world around us and our own nation. We know that just in recent weeks there have been some terrible things in the news. We think of the tragic murder of that young lady and then another young man who has been murdered recently as well. And then we think of the violence and the chaos in city centres when protests have got ugly and got out of hand. And we see the division between those who are trying to enforce uh, authority and peace and those who are trying to be heard and fight for fairness and equality. And Lord, we see there are faults on all sides. There are difficulties and problems all around. And politicians, they might claim to have the answers, but they don't. So, Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for your grace upon us. We pray for wisdom for those who rule. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for those who keep the peace. But most of all, Lord, we pray for revival. We pray for a revival like that that we see in Ezra's day, in Nehemiah's day, when the people stood in the rain, desperate to hear your word, desperate to hear what you had to say. They stood for hours on end, listening, and they put those things into practice. Oh, Father, we pray there would be revival in our nation as well. Lord, we ask that in these things your name would be glorified. We pray that in our lives, through our behaviour, our words, our conversations, uh, our obedience to the law. Lord, we pray that we would be a powerful witness to your goodness and your grace. And to the truths of your word as well. Help us as we speak to our neighbours. Help us as we speak to our friends to be full of the gospel and to be full of Christ as well. So bless us this morning, we pray. Be with us, we ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I want to read from uh, Luke and Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And um, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we'll start at the beginning and read the first 32 verses. So Luke chapter 1, sorry, Luke 12, verse 1. 
<clears throat> Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labour or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Well, this passage that I want to look at this morning is one which has really helped me. I read it a few months ago in our church reading scheme and um, I've not had a very good day. I was tired, I was stressed, I was worried about the things that had happened and I was worried about the things that were going to happen and uh, I was ready to go to bed but I hadn't read my Bible all day and I had this battle inside. Should I read my Bible or should I just go straight to bed? Well in the end I sat down at the kitchen table with a cup of tea uh, to read and to pray but I did so grudgingly. I didn't really think that the Lord would speak to me through his word. But God is gracious and through Luke 12, particularly verse 32, the Lord did speak to me. And after a day of worries and fears, he gently encouraged me and lifted me back up. And if you're ever worried, if you're ever fearful, which I guess if you're anything like me, you probably are. Well, this verse should encourage you too. Luke 12, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Well, there's three things that I want to observe from that verse. Firstly, Christ's command. Jesus here gives us a very clear command, doesn't he? He says, do not be afraid. Now, when he says that, what sort of things is he talking about? What might we be afraid of? Well, we can look back to verse four, because it's possible that we might be afraid of people. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that can do no more. Now, Jesus originally was speaking to his disciples and the disciples may well have been scared of what their neighbours and their friends would say if they discovered that they were followers of Jesus Christ? Would they be mocked? Would they be rejected? Would they even be killed? Well, often we can worry about our reputations, can't we? What will people think of us if they know we're Christians? How will they treat us? And yet Jesus says, do not be afraid. So we can be afraid of people, but then we can also be afraid of authorities, can't we? Have a look at verse 11. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities. Now the disciples weren't wealthy people. And I'm sure they, they, they were scared about what would happen if they were forced to go in front of powerful, wealthy, mighty people. What would the Pharisees say at them? What would the high priest say to them? What might the Romans do if they stood in front of the Romans? If they were arrested and tried, what would they do? How would they respond? How would they defend themselves? And they must have been worried about the authorities. And in today's culture, as Christians, we're very much going against the flow, aren't we? And perhaps we're worried about uh, teachers, police, judges. What will we do if we have to stand in front of the authorities and defend our Christian convictions? You could think back to two or three years ago when the, the Ashes Baking Company were taken to court and they went through all the different levels of the courts, didn't they? Uh, these days, perhaps it's, it's more transgender issues which are likely to uh, bring us before the authorities. What does Jesus say? He says, do not be afraid to not be afraid so we can worry about people we can worry about authorities but then we can also worry about our daily needs can't we verse 22 therefore i tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or about your body what you will wear i'm sure the disciples were worried about daily things uh, they didn't have a great amount of money in the bank did they they didn't have particularly prestigious jobs and perhaps they were worried about the future, about food, about clothing, about health, about their families, how they care for them. 
And these are all legitimate concerns, aren't they? They're things which we need to be concerned about in order to survive. These things can cause us lack of sleep and grey hairs. Uh, after the first lockdown began a year ago, uh, two or three months down the line, I saw someone and they said to me, wow, you've got grey hairs all of a sudden. And I think probably all of us have got some grey hairs, haven't we now? Have we ever lived through a time that is more stressful than 2020 has been and 2021 might be as well? Well, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Now, when someone with authority tells you not to worry, you believe them, don't you? Imagine you, you went to a doctor with a, with a problem, with a concern, and you were sat there and the doctor came in after examining you and they said to you, you have nothing to worry about. That would be a weight off your shoulders, wouldn't it? That would be a relief because someone with authority has told you not to worry. And when the creator of this world, the one who formed you in the womb, the one who has catalogued all the days of your life, when he says to you, don't be afraid. Well, that's a relief, isn't it? Now, the word for fear in Greek is phobio. And that's where we get our word phobia from. What is a phobia? Well, it's an irrational fear. I wonder if you know how the NHS recommends treating phobias. Well, there's two things they say to do. Firstly, counselling. You should talk about your fears. And secondly, a little bit more complex this one, it's called cognitive behavioural therapy. And what it basically means is that you'll be gradually exposed to your fears. So if you're scared of spiders, they'll show you a picture of a spider one week. And the next week, they'll put you in a room with a spider in a, case, in, a, in a glass case. And then the next week, they'll get you to hold it. You see, they're gradually exposing you to your fears. And the aim of both those, those treatments is to teach you that your fears aren't actually as serious as you think they are. They're trying to get you to put your fears into perspective. That is what Jesus is doing in this chapter. He says, yes, people can be scary, but the utmost worst that they can do is kill your body. They can do nothing beyond that. They can have no power over your eternal soul. And he says authorities are powerful. Authorities can be scary. But if you are standing on trial because of your Christian convictions, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. And he says your daily needs are important. But you know what? God knows what you need and he will care for you. So in this verse, we have Christ's command. Do not be afraid. But the second thing we see is Christ's compassion. You see, when Jesus realises that his disciples are full of, of worries and fears, does he turn to them and say, you're an utter disgrace. Pull yourself together. Stop worrying. Well, no, he doesn't, does he? He says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Now that warmed my heart when I read it. Jesus doesn't rebuke. Instead, he gently persuades and encourages us to not be anxious. I wonder if any of you know how many sheep there are in the UK. I wonder if you've been out and counted them one night when you wanted to go to sleep. Well, apparently someone has. And he says that there are 22 and a half million sheep in the UK. And hundreds of British farmers have over a thousand sheep in their flock. Now, there's no way that a farmer who has over a thousand sheep can ever know all of those sheep individually. It's impossible, isn't it? Now, I've got three children. 
and uh, I regularly get their names muddled up and forget them. But imagine if you had a thousand children. There's no way you could know them all. But notice when Jesus speaks here, he says these words. He says, little flock. He's not talking to a, to a vast crowd of strangers. He's talking to his own little flock. The Lord Jesus knows us personally. He knows us individually. We're not just statistics on a spreadsheet. We're inundated with statistics at the minute, aren't we? Each day we hear about the number of COVID cases. We hear about the number of people vaccinated. We hear about the percentage of the UK population that is. All sorts of statistics. But to God, we're not statistics. We are individuals who he knows and cares for. And what should a good, good shepherd be doing for his sheep? Well, he should be defending them, shouldn't he? He should be leading them to a place of safety and security. He should care for them when they're injured. And he should supply them with good pastures and water. Well, in this chapter, Jesus reminds us that we're of great value to him. He uses some illustrations, doesn't he? He talks about five sparrows. Now, how much are they sold for? They're sold for two farthings. Now, I've done the maths, and if I've got it right, then uh, you could take a pound coin, and with a pound, you could buy 1,500 sparrows. They're cheap as chips, aren't they? They're worthless. Yet God remembers each and every one. And we're more important than the birds. Then he tells us that ravens don't have kitchens, they don't have shops, they don't have supermarkets. Yet God feeds them. He gives them food. They don't go hungry. And we're more important than the birds. And then he talks about lilies, doesn't he? Now, lilies don't have fashion designers or makeup artists. And yet God makes them beautiful. And we're so much more important than the flowers, aren't we? And indeed, if the Lord cares for all of these things, how much more will he care for us? What does he say? He says, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He knows them all. They're numbered. Here is the Lord Jesus compassionately reminding us that we're valuable to him. And so we shouldn't be anxious. We shouldn't be fearful. Now, back in verse 32, Jesus describes the Lord as our father. How is God like a father to us? Well, he is the one who gave us our life, isn't he? Both physical life, but also spiritual life when we were born again. He's like a father to us in that he adopts us into his family. We're legally speaking his children. And then God is like a father to us in that as time goes on, we become more and more like him. People tell me occasionally that my children are starting to look like me. And what's more scary is they tell me that I'm starting to look like my father. And, you know, the, if we're God's children... As time goes on, we look more and more like him. So we've got this command, haven't we? Do not be afraid. But it comes with Christ's compassion. It comes with a reminder that God is our father and he truly does care for us. Well, the third thing I want to look at is Christ's kingdom. Christ's kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Now, there are two main differences between God's kingdom and earthly kingdoms. The first one is this. God's kingdom is eternal and not temporary. All earthly kingdoms and empires and republics 
eventually come to an end. But God's kingdom never ends. You might recall a certain politician about three years ago saying that her government was a strong and stable government. Well, that became laughable very quickly, didn't it? As her government crumbled around her. But God's kingdom is strong and it is stable. In Matthew 25 and verse 34, we read that this kingdom has been prepared for God's people. That's me and that's you from the foundation of the world. When this world was formed, when it was founded, God's kingdom began. And it was formed for us. So God's kingdom is eternal and not temporary. Secondly, God's kingdom is concerned with the spiritual and not with the political. When Pilate asked Jesus if he was a king, how did he respond? We'll have a look at John chapter 18 and we'll see how he responds. John 18 and um, verse 36. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You see, Jesus isn't building a kingdom based on the strength of armies or politics. But it's based on the living word of God, transforming hearts and transforming lives as well. C.S. Lewis noted that human kingdoms try to improve people through better education or through science, or if those things fail, through enforcement, through police or dictatorships. But ultimately, none of that can ultimately succeed, can it? God's kingdom is the only kingdom which can transform broken sinners like us into godly saints. Romans 14 verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So you see, this kingdom that our Father gives us is so much greater than anything this world has to offer. This whole chapter in Luke 12, it's really a call, a wake up call for us to put our lives into perspective. Why should we be worried? Why should we be anxious about things that just won't last? But of course we shouldn't, should we? How do we become citizens of this kingdom of God? Do we have to pay our way in? Do we earn our way in? Does it depend on, on when or where we were born? Just this last week we've filled out the census, haven't we? Um, listing whether we've identify as British or English or I don't know what you've put down but in order to get into earthly kingdoms you have to be born somewhere or pay a huge amount of money to be let in. Well, how do we get into God's kingdom? Do not be afraid little flock for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You see none of us are good enough. None of us can earn our way into God's kingdom. It is a free gift of God. You know, when Jesus hung on that cross, a great transaction was taking place. Our sin, my sin was laid on him. And in return, his righteousness, his holiness was given to me so that I can come boldly into God's kingdom. As a free gift. How's that possible for you? Well, you just need to repent, to confess your sin, to say that you've had enough of sin, to turn your back on it and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to this world to suffer and die in the place of sinners. Well, what is the father's attitude to giving us this kingdom? Here is a father who delights in giving his children the kingdom. He delights in pleasing them. 
He delights in helping them. It's not a chore to him. It's not a drudgery. He doesn't complain about it. It's a pleasure. He's been pleased to give you the kingdom. Doesn't that just strip away your fear? You know, whatever happens to your family, God has given you the kingdom. Whatever goes wrong in your life, whatever health issues you face, whether you get kicked out from your home, whether your, your, your bank runs off with your money, whether the police come knocking on the door, whatever happens, whatever disasters you face, the Father has given you the kingdom and no one can take it away. Isn't that wonderful? Why be anxious? Why be fearful? Your good father is pleased to give you his kingdom. Well, then we've seen Christ's command, haven't we? Do not be afraid. But that command comes with Christ's compassion, his tender care and love for his flock. And we've seen Christ's kingdom that we've been given and promised for an eternity. But can I say, if you aren't a Christian this morning, then the words of Luke 12, verse 32, they're not for you. You're not part of the flock. And so you can't expect the care and the compassion of the shepherd. You know, if that's the case, can I plead with you this morning that you need to repent of your sin. You need to turn to the Lord Jesus before it is too late. Come to him. Ask him to be your saviour. And he has never said no. Well, several times since I first read this passage, those two or three months ago, I've worried. I've been fearful. And, you know, God's good, isn't he? He has brought this passage to my memory. He's reminded me of it. And I've been encouraged again. I've had peace, even when things have been going uh, poorly or going wrong. So, friends, I, I trust that's been helpful to consider that passage this morning. And I hope that you've been encouraged from God's word. And what he has to say in Luke 12, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have that command to not be afraid. And Lord, we know there are so many things in our lives which we are afraid of. But help us to trust your word and to believe in you. Thank you for those great promises you give us. That you have given us the kingdom, although we don't deserve it at all. You have allowed us to come into your kingdom as citizens, as more than citizens, as your children. So, Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray that whatever disasters we face tomorrow and in this coming week, you would help us to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray in his name for his sake. Amen. It's been good to be with you virtually, at least in this way. And I trust you'll have a good time of fellowship together now.